Thank you. Now, Tony Lynn, describe to us how a multidisciplinary team is rallying to address a vexing problem. This is um, what Colin Beyer does as well. He's an interdisciplinary ecologist. He focuses on the science and practice of ecosystem stewardship, collaborating with a broad range of scientists and practitioners to address how landscapes respond to multiple drivers of change, how these responses shape the capacity to provide ecosystem services and other benefits, and then in turn, how changes in these services will impact the well-being of human populations. Colin is an associate professor in the Department of Forest and Natural Resources Management at SUNY ESF, and he's going to speak to us about using monitoring data to measure how forest management, land use change, pollution, and other factors synergistically impact the multiple benefits provided by Northern Forests. Thank you, and I, I want to share a little bit of, uh, of our work where we've really been, the last four or five years, working with a lot of partners people like yourselves generating long-term data and, and deriving some more uh, value from that data or learning some new things with that data or kind of along the lines of what Tony Lynn does is transitional efforts with that data. And then particularly to addressing this, this topic of ecosystem services, which everybody's probably heard this. Many of you probably heard it more than you'd like. This is essentially the benefits that ecosystems provide people, and many of us know about these already. This, in some ways, is a, a reframing of something that many of us care about and why we're in this line of work. Um, but I'd like to share a little bit of the work that we've done specifically for this group so you understand how we're using some of this data to address new questions or new wrinkles on, on questions that have been around for a very long time. So the question is, why measure ecosystem services other than pleasing the latest buzzword fantasies of your funding agencies? Um, it hopefully does provide a better accounting of the kind of cost benefits of the externalities of the management practices that we use, the decisions that we make. Um, it maybe helps to internalize some of the externalities when we only focus narrowly on a certain thing. Um, but it helps us to identify the beneficiaries of stewardship and conservation. It provides evidence to policymakers and decision makers of some of the, the, the coupling of human condition to a variety of environmental factors. But it also translates this in a somewhat more utilitarian economic sense, which our policymakers tend to be a little bit more responsive to as opposed to arguments that are purely natural science based. And it's not strictly just putting a dollar value on nature. It doesn't just have to be that. It shouldn't be that. And the science of ecosystem services has moved beyond that. So we can do non-monetary assessments of value. We can also translate some of these things to monetary values responsibly, carefully, and thoughtfully um, as, as needed. The question of why use long-term research and monitoring well in part because it hasn't really been leveraged in the ecosystem services science. Um, but it's really powerful information. It captures dynamics over time. And for a lot of services, a lot of the benefits that we care about, we care about when we're getting them. We don't need storm protection during a dry period. We need storm protection when a storm is happening. Um, we, we don't need water. We're not concerned about water supply you know, during a normal year, but during a droughty year like we've had this year, we're more concerned. Um, we can also understand how things respond to multiple drivers of change, which is a big part of my talk today. Um, when we monitor long-term experiments and we look at reference conditions, it gives us a basis for causal inference. Sometimes just pure observation, it makes it very hard to identify signals from noise, to identify cause, as opposed to just correlation. Um, and, and a lot of the funding agencies, particularly NSF, is shifting the LTER model, the long-term ecological research model, to include social in front of ecological. And some, some groups have embraced this, and other groups have really struggled to try to meet this challenge. Um, and, and in a practical way, it helps to further demonstrate the value of these monitoring efforts, which I think are already very valuable, and we agree with that. But hopefully, any help we can get, especially moving into January at this point, to demonstrate that this work has value for people as well as for the broader world um, is, is important. So we've developed some, um, a set of tools, a set of methods that's ongoing and evolving. I learned a long time ago it's good to have a good acronym, so we call this FEST. Um, uh, and it, it essentially measures whether ecosystem conditions and dynamics as we measure them through monitoring, as we probe them through experiments. Do they match our human definitions or our demands or our preferences for different types of benefits? Do they match what we consider to be clean water? Do they match 
the, the flows of water that we want? Do they, do, are, they, are they removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere? They're removing pollution from our rainwater, etc. cetera. Are they providing us the timber, the maple syrup, the other things, the fisheries, et cetera, that we, that we see? And without getting into too much uh, depth on, on the methodology specifically, there's a number of papers out there that talk about this. Oops, sorry. Um, I do want to point out that we've drawn on a lot of long-term studies, particularly experimental studies from a variety of places, uh, particularly... Um, hello. Yes, it is. Let's get them to... Which one are you? There we go. All right. So we've drawn from a number of long-term studies, particularly those like at Hubbard Brook, um, whole watershed experimental studies, um, and and where we where we can look at a whole watershed unit and its response to change over long periods of time, um, and where they've done deforestation, like at Watershed Two at Hubbard Brook, as well as some more realistic management treatments. Um, including at Turkey Lakes in Ontario, which is shown in blue there, and the Never Sink River watershed, or the um, in Cross Valley, as it's known to many people in the New York City uh, drinking watershed. Pulled together a lot of data, I think, along the lines of where, where the new monitoring cooperative is. Um, I forget the forest ecosystem monitoring cooperative. Did I get that right, Jim? Um, uh, in terms of building these, these, these 21st century databases with open source geo-relational database and modeling platforms, essentially combining something like Postgres with, with R and developing a lot of web-based data visualizations and a lot of flexibility for analyzing this information. Um, so we pulled all of the data that's available from places like Hoverbook and elsewhere into our own database. We're not serving it to the public, but that's a logical step. Other people, that's their responsibility. Um, so how do we use this quote-unquote big data? If you're talking about daily stream flow, daily temperature, all of these data for 60 years at a place like Hubbard Brook, how do we use this um, to measure ecosystem services? Well, essentially, we've been, like I said, we've been comparing these values to values that we can identify as benefit-relevant indicators. So what values of a stream uh, stage level or a stream flow are, are acceptable to people and which ones of them aren't? Um, and so for an example of that, looking at flow regulation, we can say, we can look at the precipitation, stream discharge data, along with historical water use, which sets a lower bound for how much water the stream needs to provide to make up its share of what the Grafton County, in this case, in New Hampshire needs, versus the engineering specifications of the Franklin Falls Dam, which does basically set that higher level um, uh, that helps us define the flood threshold. And we assess the discharge data using those thresholds. And they aren't perfect thresholds, but they're our best attempts to represent human demand on either side of this equation. And we want the stream to be in between them. We want them in the Goldilocks zone. Not too much water, not too little water, but somewhere in between. And we can derive a number of metrics from that because we have hundreds of thousands of data points. Similarly, we can look at quality and evaluate it based on federal and state secondary standards for drinking water. Um, we can also look at the relationship between the amount of nitrogen pollution in rainwater versus that in the stream and talk about the role of the forest in reducing the nitrification potential of rainwater, which is important. Um, of course, there's questions about the missing nitrogen, and I don't want to delve into that because we'll all um, spend a lot of time thinking about that. But um, the, the point is, is we're trying to understand relationships between the functional loads on the system and how those systems regulate things as it relates to water. And so some of the initial results, when we look at Watershed 2 at Hubbard Brook, where they cut everything down, they laid down herbicides for three years, and basically deforested the watershed as close as they could and removed that forest vegetation from the watershed, we actually surprisingly saw that they still both regulate, regulated flow reasonably well. Now, Breck Bowden or others are here, they're probably still something at me, because I know that they were there and they watched Watershed 2 stream flood um, and we did see some difference in flood prevention, and we did see some difference in drought mitigation. That's basically keeping a base flow during a dry period. But it's really important to note that this experiment was done during the 1960s drought, really, the last drought we've had in the Northeast, comparable to what we had just this year. Um, and so there weren't a lot of storm conditions during this time when we had to look at it, which influenced some of the results that we've seen. It's not that the stream didn't flood, but it didn't flood very often because it just didn't have the storms to, to drive that flooding. But we can evaluate this in a variety of ways, and of course we can adjust all of our thresholds along the way. 
you can look at nitrate regulation, you can look at the removal of pollution, you notice in the middle, in the middle chart there, uh, chart B, that red line indicates when they deforested the watershed, there's huge fluxes of nitrogen into the streams, as we know, most of us are familiar with, with at least the basics of the, of the watershed experiments that Hubbard broke. Um, and while the reference watershed remained in that sink for nitrogen, um, but as once the vegetation was allowed to recover in watershed two on that red line, you see it drop back down again and become a sink for nitrogen. And we can estimate how long it takes for that watershed to make up for the amount of export that it had. Um, I'm going to get faster at this next time it happens. And we can also, of course, look at climate regulation and carbon storage, which is, which is important, but it's not particularly fascinating or fun. It's actually relatively easy to do from, from uh, there's a lot been a ton of work on that. And it's not trivial, and there's a lot of complicated aspects to it. But part of the problem with this, like I said, is this watershed experiment, this devegetation, was done during a droughty period. It doesn't necessarily tell us anything about today when we're actually in one of the wettest periods of the last several centuries, except for, of course, this year. Um, but that's part of the point. We're swinging between extremes as our climate changes. And the ability for our ecosystems to regulate, to moderate, to mitigate some of these extremes in ways that benefit us is very important to understand. So we can model based on data from these long-term experiments what happens if we simulate an increased storm? How does the watershed respond? And does the devegetated watershed respond differently than the reference watershed? And again, what we found is that there wasn't that much of a difference here, which we know probably is not going to be the case in, in, in today's uh, era with the types of storms that we're having like Irene and Sandy. Um, we also see that there's actually more of a capacity for the devegetated watershed to mitigate droughts, and this is just because there isn't vegetation taking water out of the system, right, for evapotranspiration. It's all going down into the streams. That may not necessarily be a beneficial thing, right? But we see some of these trade-offs as related to both dealing with storms and dealing with droughts. Now, Raise your hand if you think what they did in Watershed 2 is a forest management treatment. Thank you. Does anybody do that? Does anybody cut everything down, leave it on the ground, and then throw glyphosate down for four years? Nobody does that. That's not forest management. That's deforestation. That's devegetation. Right? And it's a very useful experiment, right? But it's not a realistic treatment. So we looked at others that were maybe more realistic. So if we synthesize all of our water quality, water flow regulation metrics, from these experiments, and we look at what happened with the deforestation, and we scale them to the same uh, index. We look at that water regulation delta. This is the comparison between the cleared watershed and, the, and a reference. We see this big drop in the water regulation services. If we compare that to a strip harvesting experiment done later at, at Hubbard Brook, where they, they harvested the whole watershed over a period of six years, but in strips, you see how small that decline in those water regulation benefits are? Similarly, the whole tree harvesting, which is more relevant today because people are maybe a little bit more interested in sweeping residues and using it for biomass, you see it had a stronger impact, but it's nothing like the deforestation experiment. So the lesson from this is let the forest regenerate. If you let the forest regenerate, the benefits in terms of water regulation are likely to come back much more quickly. It's like forest that's water. It's not that simple necessarily, but that's the basic idea. We've known this. Forces have known this. Landowners have known this. Right? We're just trying to put a finer point on it and translate this in some ways that, that speaks more to some, some present science. We then expanded this from just Hubbard Brook, and we looked at a number of other places. So we looked at 10 watersheds under 10, um, under 10 prescriptions, and I'm almost out of time, so I will try to and go a little bit quicker and not already going too fast. Um, and we looked at 10 different services, and all of these different watersheds had different management treatments that are a lot more realistic, I think, and representative of what might be done in northern hardwood systems, with my apologies to those of you in Maine. Um, not that you don't do northern hardwood silviculture, but um, the strip clear cutting, various different selection harvests, and so forth, and we can synthesize all of these and plot these different benefits and the difference between the reference watershed, which in these cases is always the blue line on the spider web. As you get to the closer to the center of the spider web, that's where the spider is, that's bad. Right? It's lower. Right? As you get to the further out of the spider web, that's good. 
um, a higher value for that benefit. And you see we've just plotted all these benefits around the spider web. Right? And so we can compare this across all of these different treatments, these different sites. Of course, the treatments were done at different times, so we don't want to jam them all together because they're done at different times and doing different things. But the upshot of all of this is that we don't see much of an impact on water regulation when we manage forests with, 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 with silvicultural methods and allow the, the, the forest to recover. That doesn't mean there is no impact. What I'm saying is that the impact relevant to human demands for clean water and regulation of flow is nominal and transient. But there's bigger impact, obviously, on climate regulation. There's bigger impact um, on pollution removal from rainwater. And those are things that we need to certainly think about. I'm going to skip over this very quickly just to show that we've done it in terms of ana analyzing the probability of a flood prevention benefit along a range of different storm intensities. Similarly, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, and the probability of a drought mitigation benefit under different conditions of drought. Is it okay if I have one more minute? Thank you. And the point here is that the changes in these benefits are greater with more intensive harvest. So the more intensive of a harvest we have, we do see more of a change in water regulation benefits, particularly for, like, for preventing um, or for mitigating flood conditions. And that's an important thing to consider in the future. Other types of monitoring other surfaces very quickly, something that a lot of us might be interested in is doing whatever we can to catch this little guy, um, or hopefully big guy, if we're lucky. Um, is fishing, and, and I just wanted to show that we've applied these methods to other types of monitoring data. Many of you may be familiar with the issue of acid rain and the Adirondacks, and particularly the Adirondack Lake Survey Corporation, which has been around for almost 40 years, looking at monitoring changes in, in, in lake chemistry and fisheries. And we developed a logistic model based on their data and coupled that with a benefit transfer methodology to basically say how does the expected value of a fishing trip based on whether there are trout in the lake or not um, vary based on pH and based on whether the lake had ever been stocked. And it provides a conservative or a very partial estimate of the economic damages associated with acid rain impacts on fisheries in the Adirondacks. It also helps us to understand the benefits of sliding the lakes back further as we can through emissions caps, which have been very successful up until now, and we should all fight for those, fight for those, not to go away, despite what happens to EPA in the next few years. But the benefits that we've seen of emissions caps, we can see the value of these fisheries increasing again. And we can also evaluate when stocking is most used in management practice. So I'll wrap up by saying we can look at the impacts of forest management, we can look at the impacts of climate change, we can look at the impacts of changing deposition loads, try to capture that complexity, but all of that is based on monitoring data. All of that is based on continuing to watch these systems as they behave. Um, and I apologize for going on here, but thank you. Well, I think it's it's known. I think the, the idea of protect forest, protect water is known a lot. But I think the question of what does it mean to protect the forest, I think, is a nuanced point that needs to be addressed. In the sense of some people think the protection of the forest means never never cutting a tree, never managing the resource. Um, and, and I, but that's not what forestry is. That's not what a lot of landowners mean by protecting the forest. So. I think some of this is getting to the point that we can manage for us and continue to have good water quality, but not necessarily mutually exclusive objectives. Um, again, some have known that for a long time. Um, we have lots of examples where management has been has failed to protect water quality. I'm not disregarding those. But I think these data show, again, when we're talking about water quality in ways that's directly relevant to human well being. Um, then, then, we, then we see at least some evidence in the near east to suggest that we can manage forest for wood products as well as still have benefits in terms of water. 
and all of those things aren't necessarily harsh trade-offs. So that's kind of the message we're trying to get across. Right. Yeah. And are, are you involved in any communication um, projects to, to communicate that on a broadly? A little bit. Not much. We have a website that I don't think anybody goes to. <laughs> it's really neat, though. It's really cool. Okay. All right, let's start uh, our panel conversation.